Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours, uh, where we answer your questions 24-7. Well, we don't answer them 24-7, but we'll take them 24-7. Now, if you are, uh, if, <laughs> if you are uh, asking questions in Makana, of course, you can ask those questions during the show. Uh, you can vote on those questions. You can talk to other people about those questions. If you're not there, though, 24-7, you can um, put questions in, and that is at Ask askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. Uh, you can ask those questions all the time and they go into a Dropbox and then we put them into the show. Um, and so we'll keep our eye out for them during the day, I mean, during the show here right now. Um, but of course, you can put them in any time of the day. So if an idea pops into your head, just go to askofficehours.global. And let's go ahead and jump into those questions. Courtney, what do we have? First one comes in from Andy Kokendorfer in, down in Vieira, Florida. He wants to know what happened to the Office Hour streams yesterday? We're still working on it. So if you, if you didn't watch yesterday, if you were watching yesterday, we suddenly just disappeared. <laughs> there was a network issue um, and we're still working on exactly what those things are. We might talk about it a little bit more on Sunday, um, but we don't have that. What I will say is that it definitely uh, opened up. We've been talking about, so on Sunday, we do the show through Zoom Production Studio and we've been talking about going, building the main show inside of that show so that that show just doesn't do anything unless we need it. Um, and I think that that idea popped back up again. <laughs> so um, we're also looking at uh, potentially um, finding another space for for our hardware. So, I mean, not, not to move, but as a backup. So so we're kind of um, so we're we're just kind of looking at having, you know, we we've been talking about the need for that for years to have two spaces that have um, something that could run the show. And what we're looking at is possibly having a third space. And of course, we're, we're also working on getting up to speed with Vector. And so there's a potential that there could be, you know, the typical pace that we'd like, which is primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. We would like to have all of those uh, for the show. And I think that yesterday was a good little light of the fire that maybe we should move faster. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so, um, so I think that, that we're working on that. But we'll give, we'll give you more information. Uh, ask that again on Sunday and uh, we'll talk probably more in more detail there. Um, next question. Next one comes in from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, the electric co-op where I live will be offering two gigabit symmetrical fiber internet service soon. Currently, I use a Unify Express uh, for a router that can handle those speeds. Should I stay with the Ubiquity ecosystem or move to another brand? Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. So you could stay with Ubiquity. There, there are bump ups. I think that the Express has only gigabyte gigabit ethernet uh in and gigabit gigabit ethernet out uh but uh you can definitely get, uh, go for an edge router that does 10 gig in and 10 gig out um i only let my routers my routers are only there to deliver ip addresses i run everything else through a switch once it gets into the infrastructure so if you need 10 gigabits to go in and out uh, that's that's what I would do. Is it was basically one port in, one port out, and then have a managed switch handle everything else. You will need to get something bigger than what you have right now, as Jeffrey said. Uh, I think that I mean a lot of folks here are using Dream Machines. I think that I think that the Dream Machine will do stateful over that, but you'd have to check to be to be sure. Um, next question. Next one comes in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. He says Vox Box Air, in my humble opinion, would be distracting for interview subjects and he has a link to this strange device Go ahead, courtney <laughs> well what it is is uh it's a uh, poor man's way of doing an teratron it's uh, a beam splitter window it goes in front of the camera lens with a mirror on it uh looks something like that and uh so your director or whoever is conducting the interview has to sit behind the mirror uh right next to the camera so that makes it problematic uh uh, there's been another brand that has called this too, but I can't remember the name of it, like see you, see me or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, not as good as an electronic, uh, uh, Interatron for a couple of reasons. One is it, it has to be a static camera. Your camera can't move. You can't be on a slider or anything because then the person would have to be moving directly with the lens of the camera. It puts the person's head right next to the camera, which makes it difficult for the camera operator to operate the controls on the left side of the lens. Uh, I guess you could do the right side too, but either way, it's going to kind of uh, crowd your camera operator. Um, the second thing is the director is not looking at a monitor, so he doesn't know what the camera is seeing. He's just seeing a reflection into, in a mirror of the person's face from his perspective. 
Uh, so he can't judge the camera shot if the camera is too tight, too loose, whatever. Uh, that's problematic. But for a poor man's version of Interatron, it doesn't involve any cameras or monitors. And the second thing is it, it puts the director right next to the camera. So they, they might have a tendency to look to the side and try and look around the mirror at the, at the person directing. Go, Jeffrey. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. At first, I was wondering, well, how are they getting the director's shot for the camera? And then I started thinking, well, can you take two of these Vox boxes and put them together so they record? Because I always think of double recording when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, and, and yeah, looking at the director as opposed to looking at the little black dot in the middle of the screen, even though there is a, uh, even though there is a reflection, uh, I, would, I would guess that you'd probably want to do some sort of scrim, slight scrim over that so you don't see each other's face for there. But the other thing that it does do is it folds down really nicely and it does have a monitor option so you could turn into a, uh, into a t uh, not telestrator, but a teleprompter uh, that allows you to read off scripts. And I like that fact because with uh, with a teleprompter being on the bottom, you have to flip it vertically and horizontally to make it happen. This one, you'd only have to uh, flip it uh, vertically to make the uh, text uh, readable in those cases. So if I was doing a lot of traveling uh, tele uh, teleprompting, then this might be a good uh, solution for that. But yeah, I, I don't use it for uh, for what they were using it for. Yeah, you know, this is in in many ways. This was something that um, you know, again, Errol Morris really um, made this more popular. I mean, it was something people have been doing before him, but he had, he was the one that probably is the most known for it, uh, and he kind of coined the term in Terratron uh, for it. And um, so the idea is to get the eye contact. Um, back and we definitely when I was asked to first do in Terratron, I was like, well, this is really wonky and I don't know why we're doing this. And we kept the person who was interviewing in the same room. Um, we very quickly r learned that the person should not be in the same room. <laughs> so it bleeds into our mics. It bleeds into all kinds of other things. We don't want to have them anywhere near it. Um, in fact, we don't even need them in the same country. Um, it was, we got really good at doing it over Skype and then over Hangouts um, of doing these interviews where someone could talk, talk through it. And, and the reason that this is important um, is that the, your, uh, your eyes and your face do something different when they're looking at a person. And it's, it's a very interesting you know, puzzle um, that, we, that we, it kind of, we found really interesting is that your, your eyes converge differently. And your face has a thing where it mirrors another person when it's looking at them. So it's one of the reasons that people often look off, to, off uh, the camera to somebody um, because that response, that nodding, all those other things, it's really important for an interview. Like one of the mistakes that interviewers make is they've got all these questions they want to ask and they'll look down and they'll be, they'll be looking, at their, looking for their next question. And it actually makes it, it's actually really hard on the interviewee for the person to look down. And so, um, so there's more to it that we found that we wanted to have. So one of the things that we did is not only put up an electronic connection between the cameras and eventually do it, but also we run that through a switcher and actually key things up for the viewer, for the interviewer, so they can have their notes and so on and so forth, right, in, right up in front of them. So they don't ever have to turn their head down and, uh, and look at their notes for their next questions. Those are things that can be managed, um, you know, without them having to, to look around. It's a little easier. It's hard because a lot of folks are used to radio where no one saw them talking, but it definitely makes a difference for them to see you and to see you nodding or shaking your head or whatever it is that, re the, that response makes a huge difference. This tool looks crazy. <laughs> like, like I would never use this tool ever. <laughs> like I would rather do something else. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they're very proud of it and I'm sorry, but I would never do what they're doing here. This is, this is, you're crunching someone up against a, a camera. You're, it's making an uncomfortable production environment. We don't even want people to see bodies when we do these interviews. So we try to map everything out with, with, uh, um, you know, some kind of duvetine. We'll, we'll, we'll sit there and close everything off. So what you see is black all the way around in a little window of what you should be looking at as the interviewee. And that's all I want you to look at. Um, and it makes a much better interview when you do that. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. And, and you're limited to in the size of the you know lens that you can use into this too, but and, and it's not cheap either. It's about $1,600. Then. What? Not, I 16, didn't even see the price. 1678 and they're sold out until June. So they're not going to be shipping again until June. So okay. do you want to, Sign up for one you can now. But also, uh, the poor director has to sit at the same height 
as the lens. So if the lens is yeah, up higher, they're all either standing on a box or sitting on a sitting on an apple box to get their head low enough to be able to see line it mm -hmm. up with the lens. So it, it could be problematic. This does not work. All right. Um, next question. Next one comes in from Kyle Nesta. Uh, how would you like, how would you handle IT versus production jurisdiction for an admin of production max? A uh, small company with new in-house production team. What is the most compelling argument to not auto-update the Mac OS? Skirt device control policy. Avoid MDM on production max. I right, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Well, first of all, I would give it 100% to the IT team. And of course, that comes from a uh, former IT person. And so what I would do as an, IT, as an IT team is I'd have three types of Macs out there. I'd have the production Macs, which would never get updated unless there was a go-ahead to do an update. I would then have a test Mac that would basically build the images that would then go on to the production Macs uh, when they're ready. And then we'd have a, what, would, what I'd call a burner Mac. And that's basically a Mac that we could take out to the field and we could do an update on the fly if absolutely necessary. Uh, and then it would come right back here. If there were any problems, then they'd, they'd go right back to their production max and, uh, and, and work from there. But uh, that would be the system that I would probably set up for this type of uh, house. Yeah, I, I don't. I actually don't think there's any problem with MDM on your computers and your production computers. It's actually pretty useful, um, and so I wouldn't necessarily take that off. I mean, we've had uh, computers lost or sometimes stolen, and we know exactly where they are because they have MDM and they're checking in and telling us where they are. <laughs> so, so I actually someone stole their someone stole one of our laptops one time, and it became a source of entertainment. Um, you know, more than more than anything else, there was no way we we're going to get it back, um, but. We knew where it was all the time um, and what it was doing. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, the uh, uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, I think that it you know it, you can leave it up to the IT. I mean, the main thing is is it's just really how responsive IT is. Uh, the way that you know companies have either worked or not worked with IT is mostly if IT is not responsive to production, production throws IT under the bus. Like that's that's what happens in product in in event in production companies is hey we had a problem in our production because it didn't do x y and z and they throw them under the bus and these and it depends on how, who has the most leverage but most it teams don't want to be in that environment so they gather they either dedicate some resources to make sure that production gets exactly what it needs which is really the right way to do it is to have it run it but be very responsive to production or they just give it back to production because they don't want to get thrown under the bus every 10 minutes and so um, so the key is, is that for IT is to really be communicative with production and to make sure that they have what they need. I don't think that, I think that there's a lot of valid reasons that production needs to be more flexible um, than, than everybody else. Um, there's also valid reasons to keep everything under the same net. Um, so I would, you know, you definitely want to have a high performance system. Most of the things that we've done in the past have been um, directly with Meraki, which is the, in my opinion, the easiest one um, to build a large scale system with. Um, it's not the cheapest, but it's the easiest one to, to kind of, if you're dealing with production and with it, um, but there's a, you know, you, you know, ubiquity and others can do it as well. Now, next question. All right. Next one comes in from uh, Chautauqua, New York and Zach Stallsmith, who asked is an HDMI HDCP splitter, the best way to signal, uh, to send signal from a single Apple TV to multiple screens, uh, just for content viewing purposes. Good, Courtney. Uh, it's certainly the cheapest way. Um, you could use a matrix uh, switcher is what I think Alex uses, but you can get these uh, HDMI uh, splitters that have one in and up to four or eight out. Look for $19. Uh, that's a 1080p one. You know, if you're doing 4K, you would get a more expensive one. But they do a competent job. Uh, one thing is you want to make sure that your monitors are all the same resolution, can all handle the same resolution. Uh, because uh, uh, there will be some HD, I mean, uh, uh, confusion uh, in communication with the uh, Apple TV if several of the monitors are different uh, resolutions and report back to the uh, to the control monitor that they want something different. Next question. Next one in from Austin, Texas, and Paul Wallace. He says. Finbold asked ChatGPT to pick up stocks. The result, a five-fold increase. See article and comment. There's an article that he pasted in there. 
not really, I know we're starting to reach outside of the office hours uh, area of expertise. I don't know if uh, stock advice is something that we should be giving you, uh, you know, so we can tell you what apps we like. And we think that NVIDIA, NVIDIA and, and Apple and Microsoft and, and many others are very, are very good investments. That's probably because they're going to keep doing what they're doing. That's all I know. Now go ahead, Courtney. Yes, I find a chimpanzee with a dart uh, works really good <laughs> as well. Picking, there's just as accurate at picking stocks as yeah. many of the uh, high-end automated stock pickers. Exactly. Uh, next question. From Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York, says, I know I'm a little late to the party here, uh, but I have a 2018 Mac running the latest OS, but obviously it is Intel-based with no Apple uh, silicon. How much longer will this be a viable machine for me in a non-production aspect? Uh, Jeffrey? I have a 2011 MacBook Pro that's running uh, in the other room right there. It's, it's, there's a lot of different uh, uses for that. Uh, I just went to a, uh, a mixing uh, audio mixing training, and, uh, and the instructor basically said something that was very thoughtful, and that is he doesn't use the latest uh, MacBook because he doesn't need the latest MacBook. And if somebody decided to come over during a live show and spill their beer on his MacBook, then he's not really out of a major cost in in replacing that he just has to go on on ebay and find another macbook uh two thousand i think his was 2013 uh, or uh, or better so there's a lot of different things you can run xps off of that macbook you can run you can use uh, use it for a chat bot you can use it for anything and if it really starts to get bogged down from the mac os you can always switch it out to linux go ahead courtney yeah, yesterday I decided to go on a little project tour and I dove into my uh, closet and pulled out my three MacBook Pros, which range from uh, 2011, they're all Intel, from 2011 uh, to 2015. Now, those are pretty long of tooth. I thought, well, maybe I'll try and update the operating system. And uh, no go there because I couldn't remember my iTunes password. So uh, I was unable to update them. But they do still run fine as far as surfing the web, doing email, those kind of tasks. They're certainly up for that. When Apple went from the Intel uh, dual cores to the uh, to the M1 silicon, it was a big jump in, in uh, uh, speed for uh, doing any kind of video work is much faster on the M1 chips. But if you're, you know, unless you're going to watch 4K, videos it will struggle with that uh if you're watching 1080p on you know on a browser uh you might see some drop frames but for general work uh you know spreadsheets word documents composing composing stuff and sending email it should work fine for you i i don't know how great they will do in a zoom call because i am unable to get mine to update the hardware go ahead, jeffrey there's one other thing. Mickey mentioned that uh, you make sure that, that you know, because they can be very power hungry, but power is a very important thing. So if you're pulling a MacBook out of your closet to use it for production, or even if you've been using it for a few years plugged in, you might want to go in and check out those batteries. And if they're starting to swell or if they're not really powering up, then you might want to get those changed out. Because if the plug goes uh, out of the MacBook Pro... Well, I think he's using an iMac he, right now, so he's trying to... He's using an iMac, okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. I have a 2017 iMac that I still use. I use it a lot for data transfer. It's also got older operating systems on it, so it allows me to open things that I couldn't open somewhere else uh, and move things around. And so um, I like I keep it around, and I do stuff my kids are still, you know, they're downstairs. They've got two iMacs. I think they're 2014 and, you know, they're building 3D models and printing things and um, doing stuff in logic. It, 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 the computers are pretty fast. <laughs> you know? And so, uh, and really what's happened, and I think people have talked about this, they blame the iPad software, for instance. But it's really the fact that the software developers, most software developers are not taking full advantage of the hardware. The hardware has kept on growing and software has not kept up with taking full advantage of what the hardware can do. Um, there are apps like Zoom for one of them, but also Unreal Engine and others that actually suck up a lot more of that of that uh, content. The other thing to think about is using it as kind of glue. I use a lot of my old Mac minis. I have pretty old ones that, that are um, that you can use to just tie real stuff together, be music players, so on and so forth. I think I still have a Mac mini with a CD-ROM in it that is still running um, a key server <laughs> that I need. So there's a lot of things that they can do. The other thing is you go, well, I don't know how to do that. 
there was a thing that I, um, I'm starting to play with a little bit. I haven't successfully made it work yet, but I've gotten pretty close is, um, you know, the, someone on Twitter, uh, asked, uh, asked ChatGPT. they said, they just said, define how Tetris, all the spe uh, specifications of Tetris now write this in Python and it wrote it <laughs> and they started playing it. <laughs> and so, and so, they, and so the thing is, is that there's a lot of things, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily release that as a product, but there are a lot of things that, um, that you can have, uh, you can write now, um, that is just you asking, you know, we were talking about CJ was successful at doing this with some, uh, you know, with a, with a, something inside of resolve that you can write it to do all kinds of things. And you don't have to know how to code at this point. Um, again, I don't know if that's going to build valid code that I would release as a product, but it will, um, for you to just make things that work at the house. It's pretty nifty. So um, now we're going to be playing a lot more with that as we, as we go forward. Next question. Coming in from Douglas Carmichael, and he asked Jeffrey, it's interesting that you carry both a Mac Mini and a MacBook Pro with the performance per watt of Apple Silicon. Would you ever consider two MacBook Pros, one larger and one smaller, or a MacBook Pro and an iPad? I go ahead, Jeffrey. So for those who don't know, yes, I do carry two Macs with me on travel. I carry a laptop version and then I carry the Mac mini. The reason there, there's two reasons why I carry the Mac mini uh, and not a Mac studio for that matter uh, is because if you've got two laptops, you've got to find a place to put them. You've got to have a bag to put two laptops into. I use a case logic bag, which is a, a camera bag that has the Velcro inserts. I ripped all the Velcro inserts out and then I can put a lot of things in there. My cameras, my wireless, my, uh, my Mac mini, of course. So in the back area, that's where you put in the laptop. So I also bring my iPad with me. So three things that I can use. The Mac Mini, and this is the second thing, the Mac Mini, the best part about that is it becomes a very stealthy thing in a hotel room. If you have another Mac set on a countertop, somebody walks in, they see that laptop, boop, it's gone. Uh, or could be gone, which is why I also put a do not disturb sign on my hotel rooms. But uh, with the Mac Mini, I can put it underneath. There's usually on the nightstand, you have one with a dra the drawer and then underneath is completely open. Put the MacBook underneath there. I put my little travel router on top of that. And then if I need to do a Kensington lock or anything like that, I can wrap it around the uh, post of the uh, bed frame or, or anything such. Uh, so with that, that becomes a one-two combination. It's not impossible that I would carry two MacBooks with me, but I'd have to have a good reason, like I'm using both MacBooks in a production and I need the screens for that. Sorry, a little problem with my mute there. Uh, next question. Next one comes in from the Just Speaking Jeffrey Powers in Madison, Wisconsin. He says, using sodium vapor as opposed to a chroma key it's how they did the scenes in Mary Poppins. Uh, while it takes a lot of work, it does a better job with no matte lines. How could we improve on this technique? And here's a link. Go, Nick. Well, we could use digital, this thing, <laughs> with, with uh, green screens and such. So, you know, sodium vapor was developed in the era of film. This is before anything digital was available to work on uh, any kind of visual effects. So the... The, the more work, uh, it takes a lot of work, is that it, you know, all of that adds expense to production as well. So um, part of the work is creating optically matched perfect prisms that split the this light coming through the lens. So if you watch the video that's in the link for the question, I mean, you could also Google for sodium vapor or, you know, YouTube search for it. But essentially the the mechanics of it is that sodium vapor lights make a spike of light in a specific wavelength range of light. And it's very, very narrow. And so if the light coming through a camera lens captures that, plus all the various versions of red, green, blue that our uh, color film is going to pick up, you can take that light through the lens, split it and direct just the wavelengths that are sodium vapor to one camera and direct all the other uh, light to a second camera. And then you can use the sodium vapor camera to give you a black and white mask. And, and that's your um, mask. And then you've got your color in your second camera. So all of that has to be done 
op, like mechanically, optically in the real world. Now, uh, today, again, with the advent of digital, we can be a little bit off. And uh, the software that we use, like Resolve and uh, Nuke and, and all these things, you know, we, we could reel that in. We can use tracking markers and, and get that all lined up. But at that point, um, everything, it works just fine with green screen digitally. Uh, so you don't need a second camera. You don't need double the uh, capture space. You don't need to do all of that alignment. Uh, you can sp- focus on everything else. So uh, that's about, uh, that. that's that's it. I mean, that's why we use green screen and digital now is that now you can capture on set much more naturally with a single camera and uh, de-spill and, and adjust the colors and, and all of those sorts of things. So sodium vapor and all of its uh, baggage is not required these days. Good, Rick. So um, recently, Paul DeBevick and the Corridor Digital crew uh, actually tackled this and they Paul came up with a new solution since they had lost, uh, I guess, all the three prisms that Disney had, um, what Paul came up with was a beam splitter and a bandpass filter. So he's got two cameras, one that's capturing the scene, and then the bandpass filter camera actually has the mat. So then you can easily combine the two. And there's a great video on it that that shows the um, the process and the behind the scenes and the actual apparatus that they built. And it's really great for, since it's such a, a narrow um, band that um, it's great for things like uh, blur, motion blur, hair. Um, so it has some advantages. So yeah, there is actually a modern solution that they've um, they've accomplished recently that seems has some interesting uh, yeah. applications. That, that video is linked in the question, by the way. So if you know anyone that's on Makana that's able to see that question is able to go right to that video directly. Um, I think you also made a really important point there, Rick. Is that they were working with Paul DeBevick. So, Absolutely. like, Absolutely. you know, if you've got Paul DeBevick on your crew, you make go for it. You know, yes. um, that, that, that makes a big difference in what you're actually capable of doing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. And I think the Disney process was quite a bit different in this because I think they used a pellicle splitter at the back of the lens and a single lens and a bipack film. So that was running two strips of film and a single camera. Uh, the dual camera use is more problematic because you got to find two lenses that are perfectly matched. you got to perfectly align them onto your sensor, or you can align them digitally later, I guess, these days. Uh, the problems with uh, the problems that they used to face with photochemical matting uh, was uh, in in achieving the whole back mat, it was all done photochemically with bypacking a high contrast negative in a printer and then doing two passes through the printer. And the problem is, as you process two strips of film differently, uh, they shrink or expand, you know, they shrink a different amount uh, depending upon the type of film that it is. And so that's what creates your mat lines if they're, if your whole back mat isn't exactly the same dimensions as your original camera footage, uh, you will see the outline. And so they they spent years trying to perfect that process and finally got it going pretty good. But I think digital these days could do a better a better. Uh, uh, pass at it, and like I say, you got to have two cameras that whose sensors perfectly match and whose lenses perfectly match, and you can't do zooms very well. You can't. You have to go with fixed focal lens, lenses in that aspect. So, it's fairly problematic. I think digital would do a better job. You know, a, a lot of it has to do with creating that that really uh, small spectrum inside of a green screen as well. So you can. Again, the problem is really, it's not that you can't do it. And I think it's a really interesting academic project to, to work on, but it's not practical to do this at this point. The amount of, of work that you would have to do to maintain this would probably be not make it worth doing. Um, the and, and we've talked about it a lot. When I was at ILM, we, a couple of us were trying to persuade some Canyon manufacturers to give us a digital version of this that would split it and give us a second CCD that was just grabbing the, the data and we thought that this would be great and we just couldn't get anybody to do it. But back and back then it would have made a difference. Um, at this point, the technology, as Nick has pointed out, has gotten so good that most of the time it's really a function of how good your green screen is. Um, if you have a great green screen that is evenly lit, that is right where it needs to be in the numbers and, and, and a, a nice thin you know, um, line going across, you're going to get a really good key and you're going to be able to pull every hair if you're capturing 444 footage. Um, and so you really can get that detail right now from the green screen. The problem really is, is that 
in all intents and purposes for filmmaking, the green screen is kind of like a little helper for the rotoscope artist. You know, like it's not really, they don't, I mean, 80% uh, of every visual effects shot is, it's got some rotoscope in it. Um, rotoscope is really the bread and butter of a lot of this stuff and people are getting cut out. And so they're doing a little bit of the work there, but oftentimes the green screens are so bad that they're not they're pulling some of the key you know, that way, um, but not definitely not all the key. Uh, it does make it easier to pull hair. Um, but but I think that those are the kind of things that, um, you know, and, and a lot of it just has to do with the production realities of being outside or fast moving setups and, you know, all that stuff. You don't get the kind of green screen that, but when we do interviews, if we're doing interviews or people standing up in front of a, you know, for a, for a demo or something like that, there's really no excuse to not have really great green screens um, to make sure that those keys and, and all that hair detail is there. Um, next question. Next one comes in from uh, Longview, Texas and Danny Grizzell or Grizzly. Uh, I've been uh, running a conventional heterogeneous network infrastructure in a 50-person office. Considering moving to near 100% ubiquity, which seems like the black magic of networking, pros and cons? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think ubiquity is a really safe place to go as far as, um, you know, your networking goes. You know, so a, a lot of people in our group um, use ubiquity routers. Um, it's definitely, it's not the Cadillac that something like Meraki is, but it is definitely very effective and a lot of folks um, are very happy with it. So, um, so I think that, uh, I think you're in a pretty good place if you're unifying around ubiquity. Next question. Next question comes in from Douglas Carmichael. He says, in the IT versus production dichotomy, is there any merit to bringing production under the IT umbrella in a larger organization? Many IT professionals, like our own John Wallace, uh, can work in both worlds easily. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Putting back on the IT hat, uh, well, in a larger, uh, larger infrastructure, IT is more than just two or three people. You've got somebody that's handling uh, the email servers. You've got somebody that's handling the, uh, uh, if you're doing virtual networking, you, you get, so, so you'll, you'll have a bigger group. Uh, so it's harder to kind of blend the two. And they're already dealing with trying to figure out how to keep their parts of the system running. It, most IT people will definitely take some time to figure out what the job is because, you know, whether it be uh, video production or banking or anything, you, you got to know some of the tools of the trade. Like, for instance, with banking, you got to know all the laws or else you open up a, a port and next thing you know, you're, you've are you got a lawsuit coming because uh, all everybody's uh, bank accounts are exposed. So there there is a little bit of learning. If it went to anybody uh, maybe one uh, person that works in the server room, maybe somebody that's working on desktop support or building of desktops, having that knowledge to uh, to help them with whatever they do. Uh, but the bottom line is sometimes you just got to keep things separate. And so uh, that's where I, there, there should be some sort of line that's drawn between the two. Yeah, I mean, I think that we were talking earlier about IT managing the computers. And I think that makes sense. Um, I, I will say that I have seen production get put under IT in a variety of companies that I've worked on. And it's been pretty much a disaster every single time. So, so the, you know, having the production underneath the IT, uh, what happens is IT makes a bunch of decisions that make sense in an IT world that do not make sense in production. And they do it pretty often. And they're pretty sure about themselves when they do it. And, and um, of like, well, this is the way it should work. And it's just not the way production works. You know, I feel, you know, it's, it's, it gets into that. If you ever watch Armageddon where he pulls out this card, he goes, you know, I, who made this card up that, that says this is how far we should be, you know, in some, you know, whatever. That's what IT does. And, and um, you know, and then you have Bruce Willis yelling, this is what happens when you drill. Like, it's not that way. It doesn't, you know, things go faster and slower. And, and IT is not usually, they don't understand that because they haven't done it. Now, if IT all did production for, for 10 years and came in and did IT, you'd have a great IT team and you could do, you could do all kinds of things. But if they come from a computer background, I mean, and, and this gets back into the, it's less of an IT versus production and a theoretical versus practical knowledge. Theoretical knowledge is worse than having no knowledge at all. Like, you know, so theoretically understanding something means that you think you know what you're talking about when you actually don't. And so when people who theoretically know something are making decisions for people who are actually know something, um, it usually creates a lot of stress because the people who theoretically know it are wrong. <laughs> like, you know, almost all the time. And so, so the thing is, is that, is that they're not taking into account what it actually takes to make it happen. And so, um, so the problem is putting practical people under theoretical people is usually a really bad idea. You should be 
percolating up practical people so that they can run run it over practical people because the theoretical knowledge is not a particularly useful skill set. Um, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I wondered if in this question, Douglas was asking about uh, not just uh, managing the video department under the IT department, but actually moving video into the IT world with, uh, you know, IT-based video uh, production and distribution. Yeah, uh, I don't, yeah maybe. I, I'm so, just saying that putting mixing production underneath IT is a bad idea. Like, it's just it's just a really bad idea. No. As far as as far as operation, uh, organization, yeah, organizationally. Organization. I mean, having IT uh, run the laptops is a good is a good idea as long as they're responsive um, and they understand that they need to move quickly, <laughs> you know, for for whatever production needs. Um, and if they don't want to move quickly, then they should just get out of the way. Um, uh, next question. Next one comes in from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. How do you rapidly cover an event like a convention and create a combination slideshow with video clips, music, and narration, and turn it around uh, and turn around a presentation in twenty four hours? Um, the uh, money, money is the big thing that you uh, that you usually put into it. Um, we've done some of these where we do. Uh, time lapses mixed with video and it all it's all from day one is in part of the opening of day two to say how great it was and you know all those other bits and pieces uh, when you um, that's expensive you know we have a bunch of people out there shooting um, they deliver the stuff in almost real time we have an editor that starts editing usually early afternoon and they edit into early morning <laughs> oftentimes the edit is being delivered at three or four in the morning um, uh, for the next day. Uh, it's very effective. People see sometimes see themselves or they knew that they were there when it happened or other things like that. It's not usually a slideshow. It's usually some kind of video that, that we put in there and we mix the music. A lot of that stuff is decided early on. Um, we do a lot of pre previs for those things. And so we say, well, you know, we're going to want shots from here and sh shots from here. And so there's there's usually some, some key pieces. We know it's going to be two minutes and 45 seconds for that as, as, as a clip in there. Uh, we know that we need to have, you know, four or five establishing shots. We know where those are going to be. We need a shot of someone doing this, shot of someone doing that. So there's usually a checklist for our crew to go out and grab that stuff. And then there's about 30% of it's opportunistic. That was just a great shot. <laughs> you know, and so, so the, you know, um, so you have a couple teams that are capturing the stuff that's on the checklist and you have one or two teams that are out there capturing um, the stuff that is going to be the flavor, you know, of it, of just trying to capture people doing fun stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's really good, but I mean, those budgets for when we do them are, you know, not trivial. I mean, they're in the tens of thousands of dollars for us to do, to do those. Um, and so, and, and it, um, it's a brutal experience, but it is very rewarding and it does work the second day for the keynote. Uh, next question. Next question comes in from uh, Evan Troxell in Talent, Oregon. He says, Opus Clip has a new editor. You can add clips from other parts of your video, do manual reframing, and now has a pause and filler word removal. Thoughts? And he has a, a uh, link there. Go ahead, Jeffrey. You know, I stopped using Opus Clip uh, about a year ago because it didn't have features like that. Uh, it, it, you basically had to deal with the minute, minute, uh, plus whatever uh, video that they ended up doing. And then of course, any type of editing. You could do some manual keyframing uh, from there, but it was very uh, janky at best. Uh, so if they've added these things, of, of course I expect it because you know there's a lot of competition coming out there. I'm playing with a new one called Taja, T-A-J-A dot A-I. And uh, it's mostly for YouTube. So you basically bring in your YouTube video and it's not only helping you uh, do the SEO on the titles and the description, but also figuring out the shorts and then creating shorts for you. And one of the features that it has is taking the text and moving it around uh, on the screen so it's not blocking any type of, uh, any type of face or, or object. So uh, as we go forward, we're going to see a lot of great advancements when it comes to creating uh, shorts for videos because you just don't want to spend a lot of time on doing that, but you definitely want to have some sort of control. Next question. Mm -hmm. Next one comes in from Eric Hertz in Hartford, Connecticut. How does the uh, variable frame rates of Unreal affect output to streaming platforms? Should I push RTMP via the off-world plugin or output uh, spout or SRT from another encoder that can normalize the stream first? Good, Nick. 
So the uh, first thing to do is that you can go into project settings in Unreal and lock in a fixed frame rate if you prefer. Uh, you could also set a uh, frame rate range so that if you have some flexibility and you want to allow it some range, you can also set a range. So uh, that's in the project settings of Unreal, and, and that's the first solution. Uh, if you're... I actually don't use the off-world, so I don't know. Usually with the video outputs, I usually use uh, the Blackmagic deck link to output my video. And so each one of those video outputs is set to a fixed frame rate in the actual video configuration. So it'll be set, if I have it 29.97, it'll put up 29.97 or 59.97, whatever is being selected, and it'll do that consistently. So in I would expect that Offworld would have that, but I, I don't use their plugins. So um, the, you do also have, again, the project settings allow you to set up fixed frame rate for the entire engine. Next question. Okay, next question comes in from, as a QR code question, I think came in from Anthony Alpha in Fargo, North Dakota. Says, hello, my name is Anthony Alpha. I live in Fargo, North Dakota. And was searching online looking for how camera and lens tracking for virtual production works. Then I came across an Office Hours video on YouTube where Pixel Professor Nick Justison gave a... And it cuts off there because I I'm guess sure he went the over demo. the limit of our <laughs> QR code. And he gave it a demo. Do you want to explain, um, Nick, how that, how that works, how that process works? Uh, sure. Uh, and I... Um, so basically, there's a lot of different ways. And the, the way in my demo is to use a motion capture system that's tracking reflective optical markers on the camera. So those are going to uh, be tracked by a full tracking system. Uh, the system that we use is the room has cameras all around the perimeter, and it's following the reflective markers uh, as they move through the room. Uh, that's a Vicon tracking system. There are... Uh, inverted systems like Stipe and Mosis, where it's a single tracking camera that's mounted to the actual video camera, and it's tracking reflective markers that are static. They're on the ceiling. And so as that camera is moved through the scene, it's using what they call the star field in the ceiling to triangulate, okay, where is this camera now? So all of that is configured as equipment to stream the data over Ethernet Wi-Fi within the studio, and that data gets into Unreal Engine, and Unreal Engine solves for where the CG camera needs to be in response to that, so that all the virtual backgrounds line up perfectly with any other real camera movements. The other piece that um, can be overlooked in all of this is that the lenses in the camera are also encoded. So it's not just the position and rotation of the camera, but it's also the focus, the zoom, the iris of the lens that's being tracked and streamed into the uh, the virtual system. And all of that is calibrated in advance so that lens distortion and everything is accounted for in the, the CG renders that end up getting uh, lined up with that. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot view of that. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I got a little follow-up question for uh, Nick. Is uh... If you're tracking with the inverse system where it's using the uh, reflective markers or the targets in the ceiling with an up-looking camera, uh, reference camera, is that good enough to handle uh, pan tilt encoding on the head or do you have to, do you pull separate data from a, do you have to have a data encoded head that tracks uh, pan and tilt or is that just op tracking the optical image from the pan and tilt on the camera head enough, yeah, uh, it, accurate it, it, enough? It's tracking uh, positional as well as pan and tilt and can even track Dutch angles. So it again, it's a calibration process in advance. So essentially the system has already calibrated knowing three-dimensionally where every single marker is. And it, usually you try to place the markers in such a way that they're not just on a flat ceiling at the very top of the room. But a lot of times you'll add markers as well to any hanging grid, anything that's rigid, but you'd want to get a little bit of three-dimensional displacement in the markers as well. And again, the calibration system maps three-dimensionally where each and every single marker is. And uh, with that calibration, the it's, it's like, you know, finding your position with the stars uh, when you're navigating across an ocean without GPS. Uh, it's, that's literally the, the mechanics of the system. And so it can calculate for uh, rotation, panning, and Dutch angles as well. 
And, and, you know, one of the hard parts with encoders, um, and we've been, you know, you can use them to some degree, but the problem is, is that any very, very small variance in the rotational data that's on an encoder um, relates to more than a pixel of, of, of difference at distance. And so you're actually oftentimes tracking the information around you, barring motion blur and so on and so forth. But manual tracking of the data around you is often more accurate inside out than the encoders are. Now, there are exceptions to that, of course. Again, as you start to have a bunch of motion blur, that may or may not be the case. Um, so encoders can be useful. but. In fine tracking, we find that it's really hard to have the encoders give you the same level of detail as tracking something that's 30 feet away. And it just really has to do with uh, how much movement a pixel has to move 30 feet away um, and what what percentage of rotation that would be in an encoder is very small. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, uh, Rick. Um, another solution that um, is uh, the Vive Mars uh, tracking system, and it's kind of a standalone system. It utilizes the older Vive trackers, but it adds a, a bit of hardware to them to make them a bit more accurate and a standalone unit that integrates with Unreal. And then for lens data, there's actually a Fizz tracker that is kind of like a follow focus that attaches to the lens that then gives you that feedback as well. And it's a fairly affordable when you're considering compared to other trackers uh, unit. There are, there are, since it's using the Lighthouse technology, you know, there are it's maybe not be as accurate as some of the other tracking solutions, but it's a pretty good one for its budget. Yeah, we've we've definitely used the Vive um, in a variety of different environments where we take the Vive or sometimes even some of the the previous to the Quest, the Oculus trackers, and we'd print little holders that we would slide into the camera. So we'd literally attach the holder to the where you would, the cold mount or the hot mount at the top. You can use it as a hot mount, but, and then you'd put the controller in there and use that data to get the camera. Where, and it wasn't, as good as some of the higher end stuff, but it was actually pretty compelling, um, you know, for, for a lot of handheld stuff. Uh, next question. Next one comes in from Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. Alex, how do you avoid eyeglasses glare? Uh, actually, these eyeglasses are l more conducive to it. I had a coating on my last pair of eyeglasses that really knocked it down. I think I thought I was doing a better job than I was until I got these ones. I said, oh, I don't need that coating. I never really have a lot of glare. And then I I have a lot of glare now. So um, so anyway, but if I turn up like this, you'll see it. Um, it's just the angle of incidence uh, of the of the lights. And so these lights are, you know, it's just angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And so it, where if I'm looking here, um, you know, this is coming in here, it's going to actually be reflecting. So where this camera is by moving the camera above my head rather than below my head, the angle of incidence of that camera is going to hit my hit here and go below my um uh, b below the screen as opposed to above so if your camera is a little below your eyes and you and you look at it it's going to hit and it's going to go up and it's going to grab the lights that are above you if, if it's a little above you it's going to hit and go down and you're going to get and so so it's um where you put that camera becomes pretty important as to what kind of reflections it picks up and it's still you can still there's still a little bit of reflection there but I have to turn up pretty high to get the to actually move it up to that area. So those are some of the things that you want to pay attention to there. Uh, next question. Next one comes in from uh, Brian Enright in New York City. He says, uh, anyone ever mount a monitor on an audience facing side of a lectern? Any tips? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yes, we've done that. It's handy to have for uh, someone where you're going to have multiple speakers from different uh, organizations. You can put uh, a graphic up on a vertical mounted monitor in front of the lectern uh, that has, you know, a logo or maybe the name of the person speaking underneath. If you're not have, if you don't have iMag or something else to indicate that, uh, or the, you know, the the logo of the organization that is sponsoring the event. Uh, I think that, um, you know, you have to choose your monitor appropriately for the right size. And I would tilt it down just a little bit so it's not reflecting any spotlights that are pointed at the uh, lectern. Uh, unless you, and if you have footlights on a stage, turn off the footlights that would be reflecting in the, in the glass. Uh, use an OLED monitor because they're thinner uh, and usually have a flat back on them or look for a monitor that is not... Uh, you know, a lot of uh, TVs these days have the electronic package in the bottom and they have a very thin display, but it, uh, it doesn't cover the entire back of the monitor. So you want to find one that has a pretty uniform back on it if you can mount it on the front so that uh, 
it doesn't end up at an angle or it doesn't end up with a big gap in there. Um, I guess those are my tips and adjust the brightness on it so it's not client, uh, glaring and blinding the audience. Take it down so it looks like a normal piece of paper illuminated by light on the podium. And uh, and uh, Bob's your uncle. Then there you are. Next question. Next question comes from Rian Smith in Trinidad, West Indies. Can products like the EcoFlow Portable Power Station River 2 Pro replace UPSs for our production rigs? And if yes, how do we measure the apples to apples for runtime? Because UPS is rated in VA or volts, volt amps, and boxes like these are watt hours. Go, Jeffrey. It's a really good qu question and definitely is going to depend on the production that you do. If you're talking about having something that's going to run the overall production, I don't think we're there yet when it comes to uh, non-gasoline uh, powered generators. Uh, but uh, when it comes to little productions, I've built a device, uh, basically a system that I can go out to an event and record uh, a single person uh, like a like a band or a uh, or a, pre a presenter where i'm bringing a little power station with me i'm plugging everything into that power station i'm not using the power from the venue sometimes there is no venue power to do uh so in a case like that it works and it works really really well uh if y uh, bringing a power station for larger productions you might run into a little bit more problems you could use them as ups's which if they have the uh, ability to pass through power enough, then it works really well. But you got to watch the uh, numbers and you also got to watch the buttons because what a lot of these little devices have is they have an AC button and a DC button. You have to press that to turn it on. And then there's a certain amount of time before they'll either turn off or if they get overloaded, they'll instantly turn off. And then all of a sudden you lose whatever you have plugged into there. The last thing is that uh, if you're getting anything like that, you want to look for what's called a life PO4. It's a lith lithium. Uh, you have lithium ion and you have lithium phosphorus. And you want to get something with lithium phosphorus batteries because they run a lot safer and they run a lot longer than a lithium ion battery. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I just received a, a little email from DJI that has a new series of these uh, portable power supplies uh, uh, with flexible recharging. They're designed for camping and things like that that uh, uh, have lithium, uh, the, the lithium batteries that uh, Jeffrey was just describing. And they supply, they come in two different sizes uh, for uh, creating power in a remote location that can be charged with uh uh, solar cells, et cetera. Using them as a UPS, eh, probably not because they, you these don't have automatic switchover from power charging to power delivery, uh, which is what a UPS does. Uh, so these are uh, exclusively using your battery to power all of your equipment all the time. So uh, you would have to have some type of switchover to handle any loss of power to something like this if you're using it as a UPS. It would have to be a very fast switchover, which is the feature of most UPSs. And the problem with the UPS is they're not really designed to deliver power for a long period of time unless they're custom built with huge battery packs on them. Uh, usually they'll only run your equipment for whatever that watt hour volt volts times amps or watts. Uh, volts uh, Watts is volts times amps. And so uh watt hours are the amount of watts that you're pulling times the length of time that you can pull it so that's how long those batteries if it's rated at at one watt at uh, 30 watt hours it'll it'll power 30 watts of load for one hour so you can just divide the number of watts that you're using uh, by the number of hours into the number of hours and you get your watt hours and so um uh, and most of the most of the UPSs are not designed to to run things for a long, long period of time. Usually, like twenty or thirty minutes, just enough to shut down your equipment or save things or bring things to a close. Uh, they're not designed to run things continuously for hours and hours. Go, ahead, Jeffrey. Well, that is true. Uh, I do have to, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, with Courtney. Uh, basically, the 
it will be able to charge as it dispenses power. I've uh, I've run it before like that. There's also the uh, uh, the ability. Some of these have Anderson plugs like that Power 1000, which DJI put out. I, I looked at it at NAB, and uh, so you can put on solar panels if you're outdoors and getting uh, getting charge in as it's dispensing out as well. Uh, so, but of course, if you're dispensing out more watts than you are bringing it in then yeah, the battery is going to run out uh, sooner than later. Plug them in, see how long they last. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's how I would, that's how I would definitely test. That's how I test most UPSs. If I'm doing something new uh, is we plug them in, we put a load on them and we see what does that actually mean when it says I have this many minutes, does it have that many minutes? Like it does that math and is it actually going to give us that? It's pretty important to know exactly whether how accurate a UPS or a, a battery is. Uh, next question. Okay, next question comes from Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York. So speaking of older Macs, I have a 2009 iMac that I'd like to get the files off of. However, the uh, keychain password is unknown. Is there any way to pull the data off this machine via Firewire? or taking out the hard drive. Go ahead, Rick. So you can boot a Mac into what's called target disk mode. So you can either boot or restart and hold the T button down, and it will then pop up a, it looks like a little disk. And if it's a FireWire, I think it'll be a FireWire symbol or Thunderbolt symbol or whatever. And then it basically turns it into a hard drive and you can plug it in and, and pull files off that way. Um, or uh, you mentioned you could pull the drive and then, you know, put it into an external enclosure and, and hook it up that way. But easiest way would be just target disk mode. You go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, question for Rick then. If you're in target disk mode, do you need to know the password to access it? Is the disk encrypted or do you just have free access like a regular hard drive? I don't remember, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, it's been so long since I've used it. I don't recall, but I don't believe there was a password. I think it, you could just... Open it up, click the uh, click the little hard drive icon, and then it boots into that target disk mode. Huge security flaw, then, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, I don't. I don't know exactly what it takes to do that. I think it's actually a little more complicated than that. But I haven't done target disk mode for so long that I can't remember either. Like how you do it. I don't even know if you can still do target disk mode with the newer Macs. Um, but it, but in a two thousand nine, you might be able to actually make that work. Um, but I think you would have to launch you would still have to sign in, I believe, to make it a target disk. I don't think it'll just do it without any kind of security at all, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, next question. Next question comes in from Rian Smith in Trinidad, West Indies. He says, is running Mac in VMware on a PC a workable solution to run Mac-only production software? Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Um, not really. I, I was I was I flipped the things I thought you were talking about running PC on a Mac, not a Mac on a PC. Uh, it, there are a lot of Hackintosh solutions, so you can have uh, you can do an Intel Mac uh, as a Hackintosh if that's what you're looking to do. But if you're doing a operating system inside of an operating system, then you, you've got to keep everything as limited as possible, running smaller files. So some things could be done, yes. But if you're running something like a uh, like eCam or anything like that, you probably don't want to because you're just basically getting ready to cause yourself a failure. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I don't think uh, Apple ever released the images of their ROMs, uh, which you know control the operating system for use virtually. So that's the problem. You can go the other way around. You can uh, run a PC on a Mac uh, because there's publicly available versions of uh, virtual PCs out there. Uh, so that's a little easier than running a, a Mac on a PC because you'd have to do it illegally for, first of all, because the ROMs are not released. So you'd have to have a, and that's how all the Hackintoshes work. They use a, somebody copied the ROMs out of a, a Mac and they don't really have rights to distribute that stuff. So it's kind of done on the down low. I don't know if it's illegal, but it's definitely out of the terms of service. Uh, you're, you're, you're definitely not going to get, uh, y y you should not do production you John, I will argue that you should never do production in a virtual, like kind of a conversion from one to the other ever. Like, you know, like it's just, it, it, you're just adding a layer of abstraction that I don't think is a good idea. Uh, coming up next, of course, we're going to be talking uh, about 
building models uh, with photos and, and other things uh, here in just a minute. Um, so uh, we'll talk about uh, reality capture. Um, coming up tomorrow, we've got uh, understanding wireless transmissions. So we're going to talk about all the different options that you may have there. Um, Sven uh, Pape is going to be here from the This Edit. This guy edits. Uh, he's going to be here on Thursday. That should be a great session. Uh, talking to him about his workflow. VPN remote access is coming up on Friday. Um, we'll be talking about uh, how VPNs work. Of course, Saturday is our Q and A, and Sunday is our introspection. Um, so all of those things are uh, possible. And uh, yeah, hopefully you'll uh, check it out. You can remember you can ask the questions twenty four seven at askofficehours.global.